Hikikomori is a Japanese term for someone who has withdrawn from real life and retreated into voluntary isolation. They tend to also be neats, meaning not in education, employment or training, and are often stereotyped as nerdy hermits basically. Their occurrence in Japan started in the 70s and became much more prevalent around the 90s, and it's a real, serious societal issue. The condition is most prevalent in Japan likely due to social and cultural factors, but it's far from limited to it, with recorded cases in many countries, from South Korea and Australia to Sweden, India and the United States. In Japan, estimates regarding the percentage of hikikomori in society are between 0.6 and 1%, although the real number could be much higher than this, since the nature of the condition makes it hard to keep track, and also there are many borderline cases. But today I wanted to talk about the portrayal of hikikomori in media and how it relates to real life aspects of the condition, how it affects a person, what it can be caused by, where it sits socially and culturally, and how one might recover from it. It's a tough subject for sure, but something needs to be said, so let's dive into it and see what we can find. A recent notable example of media dealing with hikikomori would be the psychological horror role-playing game Omori. It's a cute slash creepy slash surreal slash utterly crushing experience dealing with very harsh subject matter. I don't want to spoil anything but for the sake of this video you play as Sunny, a shy boy who retreated from his school, cut ties with his friends and straight up stopped going outside becoming a full-fledged hikikomori for several years. During this time, he developed a sort of fantasy world in his dreams, made up of repression and his idealized childhood experiences and friends, where he is an alter ego called Omori. The game lets us choose between getting Sunny to quit his solitary lifestyle, aka the normal route, and succumbing to his condition, aka the hikikomori route. The former being the one where you try to reconnect with your past friends and experiences, seeking some sort of closure and all that before the chance passes by, with the latter being even more repressed, lonely and escapism focused. If you're looking for a more vanilla case of hikikomori, if you can call it that, look no further than the anime series Welcome to the NHK. It's about this dude called Sato who is a 22-year-old shut-in and college dropout who lives alone in a tiny one-bedroom apartment supported by his parents. It is pretty clear that he is suffering from some pretty serious mental health issues. I am no psychologist or psychiatrist or anything of that sort, so take what I say with a grain of salt, but in the show Sato is clearly suffering from some sort of paranoia, psychosis or maybe just straight-up schizophrenia, as he tends to experience vivid auditory and visual hallucinations, believing he is being targeted by an imaginary conspiracy organization called NHK, which he scapegoats for the rise of hikikomori like himself in Japan. Fun fact, in the original NHK light novel and manga adaptation, Sato's visions are explained by his use of internet-ordered psychedelic drugs. This was completely cut from the anime adaptation, but even so, they make it pretty clear that he is on something. Aside from that, he also shows signs of depression, anxiety and social anxiety in particular, in addition to being pretty obsessive, easily influenced by others and prone to addiction. Somewhat similarly to Omori's normal route, NHK's plot has a sort of fish-out-of-water dynamic to it, where the main character reconnects with his pre-hikikomori life. NHK's take on this man versus self quest is pretty dark, funny, and exploratory, delving into the culture, lifestyle, and stereotypes surrounding hikikomori and neats in Japan. For example, utaku culture, escapism through media addiction and pornography, and even some more obscure aspects like internet suicide pacts, among other things.
So, let's take a step back and try to connect the dots between the media and the reality. There are a couple of hypotheses regarding the causes for hikikomori, and they can be separated into three main categories. One being problems of abandonment or abundance early in life. Allow me to explain. Abandonment happens when a child is raised without the psychological or physical protection that they require, which can cause them to develop incredible amounts of fear and shame. Abandonment can happen due to unrealistic expectations set by parents, living in a dysfunctional home, being physically or sexually abused, living without basic needs being met, being pressured to hide parts of yourself, etc. Someone who has suffered abundance is on the complete polar opposite, however, having been sheltered, smothered and spoiled, which makes them unprepared for dealing with the real world later in life. Both of these extremes may lead one into checking out, isolating themselves, giving up and becoming hikikomori. The second category is mental health issues. Usually, hikikomori is caused by a number of disorders combined, namely anxiety disorders like social anxiety and agoraphobia, depression, pervasive developmental disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder, among other conditions. The third category is about broader social issues, some of which are more relevant specifically to Japanese society due to its tendency to be collectivist, highly competitive and very demanding of everyone, including young people. Some reasons are more applicable globally, like addiction to video games, social media or the internet, which can worsen the condition. In Omori, the causes for Sunny's retreat into isolation are major spoiler territory and also somewhat open to interpretation. If you haven't finished the game yet, skip to this timestamp. I highly recommend it because Amori is pretty great, so again, major spoilers ahead, including for the true ending of the game. We good? Alright. So in Amori, the major reason for Sunny's self-isolation is the guilt he feels regarding the untimely death of his sister Marie, which he caused by accidentally pushing her down the stairs during a conflict. Sunny and his sister were pretty close and prior to the conflict, she spent a great deal of time practicing the piano and preparing for college. Sunny hoped to spend more time with her by picking up the violin and practicing together for a recital. However, Maurice's perfectionism pushed Sunny too far. The whole thing started due to Sunny's experience of abandonment, again a risk factor for going hikikomori, which caused him to lash out unintentionally at his sister. But his reasons for withdrawing from society are a little more complex than just Oh yeah, he feels guilty because he killed his sister, no. It's a lot more intertwined with other, pretty much equally as important overall factors. Sunny's combined guilt, anxiety and feelings of inferiority and self-loathing over this whole situation caused him to disconnect from society and his peers, retreating first into his room and then into severe repression and outlandish fantasy, which only deteriorated his mental state further, and he kinda lost parts of himself in the process to Omori, a being he created in the first place as a sort of coping or defense mechanism. A lot of this is my interpretation of the plot, so of course you might not agree with me on some of these things, which is of course completely valid considering, you know, the game in question, but the point I'm trying to make here is that Sunny became a hikikomori due to a combination of guilt, abandonment issues and trauma, which are all real life risk factors and there is more than one at play here, so the writing is pretty damn realistic, whether they intended it to be or not. Obviously not every hikikomori has some huge hidden guilt he is hiding. In my eyes, Marie's death could also be a dramatized symbol of a more general type of guilt that humans often experience and beat themselves over, even if their actions aren't as terrible as they interpret them to be. In the true ending of the game, Sunny has to actually fight Omori, this being Sunny created to protect himself from reality, a being that embodies all of his self-loathing, depression and self-destructive tendencies, a being which seeks to consume him completely. Sunny fights this tough, mentally taxing battle while having literally no choice but to fail and try again a bunch of times. A pretty brilliant, well-executed use of game mechanics and storytelling if you ask me only to be able to proceed by the sheer force of his willpower, and of course the arsenal of tools he learned across the duration of the game, not to mention the spiritual support of his friends. 
Then and only then does he come to terms with his guilt and flaws and manages to overcome and confess about Marie's death to his friends. This whole thing reeks of Jungian psychology. It's kinda like in the Persona games when the characters face their own shadows, but now it's a million times more intense in every conceivable way. What I personally take away from all of this is that the game suggests that the willingness to face parts of yourself that you hate, repress or refuse to recognize is ultimately crucial to overcoming hardship and developing as a person and individual, alongside of course human connection and support from loved ones. This may sound corny or cliche to some, but in my opinion the ways Omori portrays and explores all of these things are super interesting and the writing really avoids the cheese factor as much as possible. The case of Sato in Welcome to the NHK is pretty different. Again, mental disorders play a pretty big role here. Sato clearly has a problem communicating with other people. He gets really anxious about it. Even anticipating interactions causes him to panic. He also has a tendency to self-isolate whenever bad things happen to him, and he often lies and deceives others, particularly in order to hide things he feels shame for. All of these things combined make for a pretty frustrating cycle of self-abuse. Sato will try to do something, then he will experience either some level of failure or things simply won't go exactly as expected, and then he will fail even harder trying to cover it all up, sometimes with complicated lies and facades, and in the end he always relapses back to what he knows best. Many times throughout the series we see how Sato feels trapped in this lifestyle, chained to this personal hell he found himself in. In contrast to Sunny's abandonment in Amori, one of the factors in Sato's retreat into seclusion is arguably issues of abundance, which we can infer from the relationship between Sato and his mother. We aren't told too much about it, but we do know that 1. Sato is financially dependent on her, and 2. She was somewhat protective, defensive and arguably enabling of Sato's behavior in his childhood. This is another factor that plays a role in the equation that resulted in Sato's current state. Regarding the possible societal and environmental factors, NHK touches upon this topic but it doesn't really place the blame on anyone per se. It usually brings up those topics for the sake of humor and satire, and sometimes for the artistic purpose of invoking emotion, especially the nihilism often associated with the hikikomori and neat lifestyles. Sunny's condition in Omori and Sato's condition in NHK are inherently different from one another, but they do share some striking similarities. Both Sunny and Sato experience a sort of journey of rediscovery of themselves and of the world around them after emerging from the depths of isolation. Both have people around them who are worried but also supportive, trying to make a positive impact even though they don't always fully understand the condition or how to deal with it. Both characters have some past issues holding them back and current issues of repression and escapism that also weigh on them heavily. Being a hikikomori is suffering and the path Sato and Sunny take also involves suffering and sacrifice but ultimately it's the more meaningful way out. There are a couple of things I take away from all of this in regards to dealing with Hikikomori. One of them is that the courage to realize, recognize and face one's natural impulses and destructive tendencies is a crucial step to recovering from the condition. Having friends and loved ones pushing you forward not out of pity but because they genuinely recognize the love and merit, tapped or untapped, within you is also incredibly helpful. It's not easy for people to understand what these characters are dealing with, which can lead to all sorts of reactions and suffering. It's inherently a heavy topic, so that much is to be expected, but in order to help such individuals it is crucial to recognize that there is usually a way out for these shut-ins, and that seeing them as lesser humans or defective or something of that sort isn't really helpful. If you interpret hikikomori according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, these individuals are quite severely deprived chained to level 2 of the pyramid, with only their most basic of needs being met. It's not something to be taken lightly.
as I mentioned before, hikikomori was seen in the past as a purely Japanese phenomenon, but even if you're not Japanese, acute social withdrawal is a very real thing pretty much everywhere, and it tends to be one of those hidden issues in society that people tend to avoid due to shame and regret, among other things. As someone who has people close to him who suffer or who have suffered in the past from isolation and social withdrawal, and as someone who had to deal with similar issues in the past himself at one point, all I can say to those of you who are watching and relate to all of this is that I know how much you are pained by guilt, shame and overwhelming regret. You deserve a second chance at life. Know that there is a place in this world where you can belong and live a meaningful life in. And if there isn't one, you can still make it yourself. Don't be afraid to recognize that you might have a problem. That doesn't mean you're forever broken or beyond saving or anything like that. A lot of seemingly normal people also need therapy and treatment. Humans are just fragile like that, and that's okay. You deserve better, but you must commit to change, even if you start out small. It is painful to say, but you either choose recovery, or you choose regret. Hey, Eden here. Hope you enjoyed this video and maybe learned something in the process. I want to thank Taiji Sato for helping me big time with the research for this video. It wouldn't be the same without him, so go check out his channel if you can. He does VTubing and also some other cool stuff. If you're interested in downloading the original music tracks I composed for this video, you can check out the description for links. I'd love to hear about your thoughts and theories in the comments. Maybe we can start up a little conversation. I was Eden from Not Aiming for the Truck. See you, Space Cowboys.